Agatha, and I am a, currently a designer at Oculus. I previously led the home, explore, and store team, and now I'm about to ship something brand new, which will be announced next week at Oculus Connect 4. So um, this is my Twitter handle. If you want, please tweet at me, because I love to read people's stream of consciousness as I talk. Um, those are always great to read. Um, so before we kickstart our conversation here today, I want to show you a very quick statement. It's kind of weird. Um, so a pregnant penguin is sipping coffee while solving Sudoku. It's probably your first time ever in your life to read this exact sentence, and correct me if I'm wrong, but none of you have ever observed this in real life. Um, but yet at the same time, you were able to construct this concept in your mind as you read it. Part of the reason why you can think about, create image of, and discuss non-existent reality is because of language. And without language, the only thing that we can probably refer to is by pointing at the physical immediate realities. So, language gives us this ability to absorb, retrieve, and connect concepts. And using language, we can talk about why Jon Snow came back to life, how Nathan Drake is ridiculously good at making war jumps, and whether Mario should have chest hair or not. Um, you know, it turns out that we can create entire universes just with our minds. So today, I want to explore this idea with you. Design as the author of thoughts, and how we can design a language to create a new immersive experience. I'm gonna talk about why language matters and how we can use that as a framework when we're designing. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll have some early work um, that I did at Oculus and like talking, talk you through about like how I actually approach and use this uh, framework. So, what makes language special? And why are we even talking about this at all? You know, when we work on games or any form of immersive experience, we are building a set of nouns, verbs, and syntax for our audience. That is the way that they're gonna be able to understand concepts and take action with what you have built. For example, the word cat. It probably has a very specific real life reference. You most probably have seen one on the internet. But what about the noun Quidditch? And how do we determine what this word is referring to? Is it even possible? It might very well be that when we're referring to these non-existent objects, we're simply talking nonsense. But yet at the same time, I'm pretty sure that I know a lot about things that aren't real. And I treat my knowledge about Quidditch as something that is fact and that there's truth to it. Just like how I know the golden snitch is a very fast ball that can fly around and have a tendency to cause a lot of chaos. But is there such a thing in our world? And obviously, for those of you who have played human Quidditch, would know that a human golden snitch does not count. So, you and I both understand that Harry Potter is fictional, but yet he feels real. And for many years, the philosopher of aesthetics wanted to make sense of this relationship between language and our minds. And so I'm gonna introduce you to one of their core concepts. The universe of discourse. The domain in which we can have a conversation or an experience, in our case, because we make games, um, it is a space to which that we can establish the rules. So for example, the statement, Quidditch is a competitive sport, is technically a false statement in our physical reality because there's no such thing as Quidditch. But it becomes a true statement as we enter into the Harry Potter's land of universal discourse. The default one that we exist in is our physical reality, but for creatives, all of us who make experiences, we all build a completely new and separate universe of discourse. It gives us an opportunity to create things that ends up being true, even though the truth does not track to our physical realities. And thankfully, us as homo sapiens, we're actually very good at distinguishing between these different universes of discourse. We have this really amazing ability to be able to jump along all these different bubbles of realities. So, we can engage in these different universes of discourse because we have a vocabulary and we also have grammar. And then they also build on top of each other. So if our goal as designers is to build rich and deep realities, our role is to be the author of these lexicon and syntax of our experience. 
we can design, curate, and formulate the language of engagement where our audience will have the agency to construct their own narrative. This is a generative way of design, which is specifically designed to support emergent gameplay and also give us an opportunity to explore what does it mean to build immersive experiences with all these new technologies. So, just like the first sentence I showed you, a pregnant penguin sipping coffee while solving Sudoku. Today is the first time you've ever come across this exact sentence, but yet yeah, I hope that none of you actually have any trouble understanding it. And that is because human language is not just a mishmash of words and phrase paired together with meaning. And in the same way, design shouldn't be a mixed bag of patterns, like hamburger menus, tabs, and scroll bars. But instead, interestingly, this philosopher, William von Humboldt, defined language as a system of infinite use of finite media, meaning that you can generate an infinite number of sentences um, using a finite set of grammatical rules. And as a designer, I think it's really exciting for us to be aspiring to move our industry away from the linear user journey flow and into a grammatical interaction system that supports emergent behaviors. Language gives us a very good opportunity to create and consume this expansive and ever-growing libraries of concept, oftentimes actually a lot further away from our limited physical experiences. So, here's a good segue into how designers can build these grammatical interfaces. So in simple term, most languages are composed of nouns, verbs, and grammar. So these are the three interlinking components that encodes and decodes information. So to apply these three concepts in our design, let's talk about you know, what kind of information do each of them actually deliver. So there's three steps to designing an interaction grammar. Number one is to identify the truth that is going to underpin your universal discourse. What do you want the audience to know about? And second of all is to construct a set of nouns that express concepts, and then to curate a set of verbs that represents action and causality. And finally is to use grammars to kind of connect all these different parts together into a mirage and the different combinations of meanings. So, I, right now, I'm going to start talking about like some of the design works and early prototypes that I did at Oculus Platform last year, and I'm gonna break down how I actually apply this framework. So here is a quick montage of some of the prototypes and also ideas that our team tested out. Um, when I first joined Oculus, it was very interesting uh, to come to this world where you know, everyone's super excited for VR, but then you arrive to the Oculus platform UI, you're like, oh, it's like a bunch of 2D tiles that is mapped to an invisible cylinder. So the question here is, how can we start to move the language of 2D into a 3D interactive model? Um, and obviously, it's, I'm gonna be very honest, it's very resource and time intensive, so I was trying to figure out a way to kind of start to move the needle a little bit and figure out ways in which that we can invest in it meaningfully. So, looking at the ingredients or the recipe that I just mentioned about grammatical interactions, the first part is to figure out what is the underpinning truth of the universal discourse and what do we want to tell the audience. And in this case, our team looked really deep into like, you know, what makes our VR platform different and why should our audience care about it? So the Oculus Rift headset and also our touch controllers are clearly something that we can take advantage of. And so after you know, sessions of exec meetings and debating amongst the teams and different stakeholders and all that kind of things, we finally arrived that you know, our platform should showcase the experience at their fullest fidelity while leveraging our hardware as the truth that we want to discuss. So the main thing I want to capture here is the part about full fidelity. Like, what does that even mean? And in some cases, if you look at our current platform, we are representing all the hard work of our developers as flat, static 2D tiles. And it's a big lossy compression. So we wanted to figure out ways that we can enhance the sense of depth and proprioception. Not only is it something that is unique to our hardware, 
But it also helps to contextualize all these kind of new and unknown VR experiences and bring it a, just a little bit closer to the audience for them to understand, hey, this is what the creator wanted you to see. So with that in mind, we started off with the basic atomic noun. What do we need to change in order to support this truth? So for each piece of the content right now, the current noun is a 2D flat tile. Not only does it review very little information visually, but it also kind of traps you into this 2D interactive paradigm where you're focusing on clicks and select. So I started to think about like, how can we bring this a little bit closer to how a hand actually moves in space? So we started exploring this concept called totems. And totems are 3D representations of content. And it starts to shift the discussion um, from a flat 2D tile into a 3D object. And the great thing about that is that we can also establish new verbs of engagement. So as you can see here, I mentioned about the prior three components, which is concept, action, and meaning. So totem in this case is the noun, which is the concept of a VR content. It also, the great thing about that is that it provides an affordance to hold and grab. So in this case, you're replacing the concepts, the actions, and the meanings by saying that, hey, the audience can express their interest by grabbing the totems. And based on this interest, we can then start to progressively disclose the relevant information our audience can take using this totem. When I say progressive disclosure, oftentimes it means that you will be able to introduce some new concept to them. So in this case, we're introducing this new concept called podiums. So podiums is a set of noun that represents spatial triggers, which I'm sure in the game industry you guys know it very well already. Um, but being able to combine the concept of a podium as well as placement, you can also yield very different combinations of state change. In this case, in this exa particular example, you can place your podium onto a you can place your totem onto a friend's podium, and then you can share it with your friends. It activates that particular feature. Or you can take away that totem and place it onto the details podium, where then you can see more information about this particular piece of content. It actually does the same thing as actually pressing a button on a flat 2D interfaces, but it gives you this proprioception and bodily sense about the space that you're navigating through. So let's take a quick look actually how this prototype worked. So this was a one day exercise for me during a hackathon to try to understand and gray box, you know, what are all these different components and how will I be able to kind of craft a language about grabbing and building a, gra a grabbable interface. So as you can see here, I grab one of the totems off of the shelf, I place it onto the details podium, I can see more information about it. Uh, interestingly, as I was building this prototype, I also figured that, hey, there's a really nice symmetry to the action because in, the, in some senses, I can take the mirror action, which is grabbing the totem off the podium and placing it back onto the shelf to express that, hey, I don't care about this thing anymore and I want to look at other stuff. So now that we've constructed this concept of noun that can be grabbed and placed, I was really curious about how this rule set can then be extended into other processes. So for example, checkouts and payments. So using the same sentence structure that I just showed you, which is, placing a totem on top of another podium, you can swap out the nouns um, for another similar behavior. And in this case, we have a basket that contains, that becomes a plural. It is the collective noun of the totems. By grabbing this noun, you can now perform actions on all these totems in bulk. And when you grab this basket, and then the checkout zone would appear, just like those podiums that I showed you previously. You can place it on top, and then the calculations would be done magically. So as you can see here, um, you have a set of totems that currently exist in this uh, basket. Once you've placed it, um, the calculations will be done. And then again, talking about symmetry and mirror actions, you can remove a totem from the basket instead of you know, ticking check boxes and then pressing the delete button. Uh, and then you can also pick the payment method that you want. So I have the Oculus credit card here that I'm going to expense um, using the kiosk. Um, and yeah, so the payment purchase has been done. Uh, this was actually, uh, I worked on this together with one of our very talented um, product specialists as well, um, just to figure out like ways that we can include, continue to build on this grabbable language. So 
the biggest lesson that we learned from a lot of the different prototypings that we've done, as well as some of the productizations of these prototypes, is that you know, it's very important to build a generative interaction language that is generous. Um, it's kind of, I was really worried I'm gonna stumble on this because it was kind of like a tongue twister. But anyways, my point is that it's important to be generous to your audience, where you give them the richest sense of agency with the smallest set of rules, verbs, and nouns. Um, and you know, it's worthy of all of us to take the time to curate the set of verbs and nouns and understand the formulas that you want to create in order to formulate different types of interaction combinations. So I'm not saying this is easy to do, especially when you're close to shipping, especially in my case right now. Um, you will be talking with engineers and other people among the team, and you'll discover that certain parts of the experience isn't expressed quite well with the language that you initially designed. Um, and it's very easy to fall into the trap where you will be like, hey, like it's okay, we're just gonna make some, you know, we're just gonna edit the rules for a little bit. Um, you know, we'll make some exemptions in certain scenarios, you can tack on an additional rule for some special cases. And that is why the first step that you take when you're trying to think through this like generative grammatical interface is super important is the fact that you and your team agree on the truth of your universal discourse. You know, helping using that would be a very good anchor to try to figure out ways to navigate through these problems. So, today we talked about a generative framework that helps to shape different universes of discourse. And inspired by linguistic theory, we explored ways to design grammatical interactions. Each engagement of your player and your user should review information about how your universe works. And everything our audience learns compounds on top of each other. And that is because language provides us with a way to predict unseen properties from seen behaviors. And not only will this give our audience the agency to construct their own narrative, but it also gives a chance for all of us creatives to build expansive reality that is far beyond our imagination. You know, as we kind of move towards this new technology like VR, AR, and artificial intelligence, our audience will live in between multiple realities. And actually, in fact, all of us will probably start to live in between multiple realities. But the great thing is that you as a creative can be the author of this fictional truth. So I'm gonna leave you guys today with this quote by Charlemagne, which is, to have another language is to possess a second soul. You know, being able to construct non-existent realities and sharing it with other people is probably my favorite part about being a creative and also a human. Um, so thank you. I would like you to say more about uh, body representation in a VR space because when I, I, I mm -hmm. watched the video, uh, the video is based on the uh, right hand user. Mm -hmm. And then you have all the discussion about uh, allowing people left handed to choose. Yep. And there is the, the, the talking about uh, seeing your, bo your body on a VR space uh, mm -hmm. interactions. So a little more words about this. and. Yeah. Yeah, so that's really interesting because um, especially with lately most of the product that we've been working on and the way that we've been conceptualizing it is that um, we basically enforce a rule of ambidextrous control. So all of the controls that you will be able to do with your left versus your right hand is mirrored across. So it definitely has symmetry across the two. So obviously if you want to grab one of the totems of your left hand versus your right hand, you're free to do so. Um, in that case, it also helps to improve the accessibility of uh, VR in general. So in some cases where, you know, if you have one of your body parts that's missing, like you can easily use your other hand to, to manipulate and control the interface. Um, so yeah, we base that a lot from like ambidextrousness as well as one-handed controls is uh, one of our, kind of like a founding rule for like how we want to manipulate um, VR interfaces. Yep. Hi, great talk. Humboldt's Thank you. really underrated, so I'm glad he threw it in there. <laughs> um, so my question is, uh, so you're creating this new language in a really interesting environment. Um, have you looked at learning curve with uh, respect to player or yeah. user interaction with these kinds of things? Yeah, yeah. So it's interesting because I think in some sense uh, VR is such a new space and it's 
quite dramatically different from the jump that mobile benefited from. Like I think mobile is still a 2D interface that borrows a lot of the language from the early webs and things like that. Whereas like for VR, the fact that it is spatialized, it means that there is um, quite a diverse range of intent that a user can express. And as a result, they expect different um, feedback. Um, and in some sense is that, you know, with the le we focus a lot on um, discoverability, but the thing that we actually care more about is learnability. And, and so there's two distinctions around that. Like discoverability is like understanding the fact that this button exists or like this function exists. And learnability is to be able to intuit the, what you are about to see and like what you are about to um, experience. And I think that's why it's valuable to build this language is that, for example, in this case, is that I know that when I grab something, of interest, like I will be able to perform and place it onto different spatial areas to trigger different sets of features. And like slowly what you're doing is that you're building a vocabulary, understanding grabbing is the way that you can express interest as well as to kind of continue to build on the different levels of interactions. So I think learnability is probably one of the biggest like benefactor by like crafting a good uh, design language as a whole. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Hi there. Great Hello. talk, by the way. Thank you. Um, I have a question when it comes to like creating this new nomenclature for um, new interfaces, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, is there like some consideration on like m different cultures on how they would uh, perceive certain metaphors, and like is there a way to kind of like gauge or test that, and how responsive they are based on these different cultures? Yeah, um, so it's really interesting because um, for Oculus, we actually do a lot of play testing. And when we do play testings, we specifically curate a very diverse set of people to make sure that we are not, we, we are being considerate of other cultures as well. And I think it's really interesting because like in a sense, when you're in VR, you can be a lot more expressive and like, you know, gestures and like, you know, body language and tone that you communicate. It's a lot higher fidelity compared to like, like trolling someone on YouTube or something like that. Um, and so as a result, what happens is that um, we, and obviously as a platform, we have to be very mindful of that. So we do a lot of play testing to cross check. Um, and luckily we also have a great team, which is um, the Facebook Spaces, which is actually a separate team from Oculus. Um, Facebook Spaces is basically um, the VR of Facebook. And they do an extensive amount of um, like user research as well as cultural research on like what is appropriate uh, behaviors. And obviously, we're just slowly kind of integrating it as a part of our design language. And like we're probably going to have some missteps. But like overall, like we're aiming to be as um, comprehensive as possible. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I got that. Uh, Hi. Wayne Khan. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, um, so I mean, Bryce uh, started off this morning talking about inclusive design and accessibility, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about mm -hmm. um, inclusive design and accessibility within VR and immersive uh, environments. Yeah, so I think um, one, of the, one of the trickiest things sometimes with um, inclusive as well as accessibility design is that um, we want to in a sense where like, we have this ability to be very expressive either through our avatar and social interactions and things like that. And so a lot of the effort has been going in in terms of like designing the entire experience to figure out like what are some of the ways that people would like to express themselves. So we kind of take like a two-prong approach. We have one which is like, okay, ways that we can enhance and promote the, someone's sense of identity as well as the fact that we want to address some of the potential um, harassment issues that like, you know, as most social platform would experience. Um, in terms of the harassment of the, um, in VR, it's actually very interesting that it's quite, it's still like a really unresolved problem, I think across the board in the industry, mainly because is that like we have a lot of good um, kind of uh, framework and structure to report and also to um, have uh, kind of like uh, this mechanism to recognize someone who's being a harasser. Uh, unfortunately, VR is really hard. Uh, VR is really, really hard to be able to capture evidence uh, against those elements. Um, being able to pass through, like, kind of transcendental, like, uh, kind of like a temporary action that someone have done as a gesture or as like invading someone's personal space, like those are really hard to capture. And we're definitely working on a lot of the policies as well as like putting in place um, measures such as like being able to capture certain. Um, 
kind of the last couple of frames that you were interactions with um, to be able to enhance that. But we're still like, it's still in the works and we'll get there eventually. Thanks. Great, thank you so much.